It started with a Facebook post that I wrote in the middle of the night that I often refer to as a love letter to Black people. Patrice put a hashtag in front of Black Lives Matter, and Opal helped to create the social media platforms that were designed to connect people online who were outraged about the acquittal of George Zimmerman, and bigger than that, outraged about the condition of Black communities, and wanted to do something about it, and connecting them online so that they could do something offline together. What is inspiring me right now and what is making me hopeful for the future? We are in the midst of incredible transformation and it's important to be present in that moment so that we can push as hard as we can for the changes that we've been needing <laughs> for so long. I'm Alicia Garza and this is the timeline of my career. I grew up in the Bay Area in the 1980s in Marin County. I started activism at a very young age. I started being an activist when I was 12 years old. My school district at the time was having a whole debate about whether or not to offer contraception in school nurses' offices. And I, of course, being a quite opinionated 12-year-old, thought, why not? Because my mom had me not expecting to have me on her own, she talked to me a lot growing up about sex. And my mom's sex talk was, sex makes babies and babies are expensive. <laughs> So that was when I was 12 and I was doing classes and trainings with my peers uh, about reproductive rights and reproductive justice, about sex, about how to use contraception, and also about how to negotiate relationships. And that spurred me to really want to be an asset to my community, to make sure that the people who I knew and loved had all the tools they needed to make the decisions that were right for them. And it also spurred me to want to do more. What I knew from growing up with my mom early on was that women have it hard. And so ever since I was young, I've had this notion that people should be able to live their full dreams, not when everybody else is asleep, but while they're fully awake. So let me tell you what happened. We did win that fight. Contraceptives were available in school nurses' offices and much more. We actually expanded our programming around comprehensive sex health education. In 1998, off I went to college. I went to the University of California at San Diego, and I chose that school because it was far enough from home where I felt like my parents couldn't just like drop in on me unexpectedly. But it was of course close enough that if I needed my mom's home cooking, I could get home within a day and get a hug and get a good meal. And while I was there, of course, I continued the activism that I had been doing uh, since middle school. I got to college and I started to work in the Student Health Center. I also started joining with students on my campus, organizing to make sure that public and higher education was accessible, especially to students of color. The thing that I'm most proud of in school uh, is that I, along with a beautiful crew of other women, organized the first ever Women of Color Conference at UC San Diego. It was an international conference. We had women join us from South Africa, and we talked about all of the issues that were impacting students of color, but in particular that were impacting women of color. Issues around access, issues around justice, issues around our bodies, issues around our relationships with each other. And what I learned from that was two things. One, that women of color need a space to come together, to learn about each other, but also to be able to build community. And the other thing I learned was that we're not alone, that the things that we experience every day that feel isolating or that create or cause grief or fear or anxiety for us as individuals, there's a high chance that other people are feeling the same thing. And when we come together, we have an opportunity to better understand the problems that we're experiencing and to make plans together to address those problems. So I graduated in 2002 and I wanted to go home and I wanted to be able to impact my community where I grew up and where I lived. So back I went to the Bay Area where I was accepted into a training program that helped young people of color learn how to organize. We got placed in local community-based organizations and we knocked on doors in communities across the Bay Area for hours and hours and hours 
helping the host organization with their campaigns. It's also where I met my partner, Malachi, who is incredible. And I don't think at that time that we knew that 16 years later, we'd be married and, you know, ready to build a family and building a community. The neighborhoods that I was knocking doors in were adjacent to the downtown area, but in particular, West Oakland, uh, which is in a prime place in terms of transportation, in terms of weather, all the things. It also is the home where Black folks are concentrated. Black folks migrated to Oakland, you know, many, many years ago from the South, um, escaping Jim Crow segregation and really rooted themselves and uh, tried to make a different kind of life free of uh, the stringent and dangerous Jim Crow laws that they had fled. However, years and decades of disinvestment had made it so that so many of the beautiful homes that uh, are dotted all throughout Oakland are dilapidated. Families are living without jobs and communities are living without the kind of infrastructure that they need to live well. I ended up joining this campaign after my internship, organizing families in East and West Oakland to join a campaign that was looking at how increasing the economic security of our families could also increase the community security in the places that we lived. We thought that building better economic opportunities was actually a better alternative to dealing with crime and violence than increasing police budgets. I started fighting that fight in 2003 and 2004 on the streets of East and West Oakland. For 10 years, I also spent time in San Francisco organizing in a community called Bayview Hunters Point. And oftentimes, even the name of the neighborhood is not on tourist maps of San Francisco. Of course, it was where most Black people in San Francisco were concentrated. It was the largest Black community that remained in San Francisco. And I fought in that community for 10 years, organizing residents against environmental racism and against gentrification and for the kind of community development that would serve everybody, not just new families that the city government was trying to move in. In case you don't know what environmental racism is, it is a process by which uh, communities of color and low-income communities are often concentrated near polluting industries. They're often concentrated towards or around toxic dump sites. In the case of Bayview Hunters Point, the community had developed around a former naval shipyard. And on that shipyard, when it was operational, there was radiological testing. In fact, there were all of these other industries that helped to support the Navy. What was happening while those industries were functioning is that they weren't disposing of toxins in an appropriate way. Instead of disposing those materials correctly so that they couldn't harm people, because it was in a poor Black community, uh, oftentimes what they would do is just bury things underground. They would bury them in containers that weren't correct, et cetera, et cetera. Ultimately, what that meant is that there's toxins in the soil. And in the community that I worked in, I often frequented a public housing development that was just adjacent to the shipyard. Most people that I talked to had asthma, had cancer, uh, had nosebleeds, um, or other kinds of respiratory illnesses. That was very different from communities in San Francisco like Pacific Heights, right, which were often wealthier and whiter communities. And so environmental racism is what happens when communities of color and low-income communities are concentrated in places that are environmentally hazardous, or they're more exposed to environmental hazards because their communities themselves are seen as dumping grounds. Working in San Francisco for a decade with families in Bayview Hunters Point and families all over the city in low income areas meant that we fought a lot of campaigns that were meant to improve the quality of life, especially for Black and Latino families. One of the campaigns that I'm so proud of is a fight that we waged to make sure that families had access to free transportation. We got to this campaign because we had a youth program in our organization and we learned from some of our students that the yellow school buses were being cut because of budget issues at the state level. The way that they were trying to balance cuts in the budget was to remove services that they thought were non-essential. So what they did was they cut money for the yellow school buses that would transport thousands of students back and forth to school every single day. And instead they wanted to put in place a plan where students would instead 
ride local public transportation, which in San Francisco is called the Muni. Well, when you ride Muni, it costs money. Riding Muni meant that you were also subject to fare increases. Well, for students from low-income families, yellow school buses were a lifeline to being able to make sure that young people could access education. But switching transportation to and from school from the yellow school buses to public transportation meant an increased burden on families who were already struggling. So what we did was we fought for transportation to be free for all young people who were 18 and under. And after months and months and months of fighting, of having students and families tell their stories, but also demand of their local legislators that they approve this proposal, they actually did. And so we won free transit for young people. That program is in place today, and it's actually been expanded to seniors and to people with disabilities. We did a lot of work together, and in the process of running these kinds of campaigns, trying to make housing affordable, trying to make an impact on poverty, we also were fighting police violence. One of the major cases that I remember is a young man named Kenneth Harding, who was shot to death by San Francisco police, apparently for evading a $1.50 fare on the T-train. He was shot in the back while he was running away. And similar to stories that we hear today, when the news kind of covered the case, they said that Kenneth Harding had shot himself. I remember this case in particular because it was right at the start of Black Lives Matter. After 10 years of running an organization fighting for Black and Latino families, in low-income communities in San Francisco. I needed a break, so I went on sabbatical. And while I was on sabbatical, I had this vision that I really wanted to focus on building power in and for Black communities. I came back from sabbatical, I left my organization, and I decided that I would be joining the National Domestic Workers Alliance to help build out a program that was focused on Black domestic workers and building their capacity to be powerful inside of the domestic work industry. But shortly before I joined the Domestic Workers Alliance, myself and Patrice and Opal created Black Lives Matter in response to the acquittal and the murder of Trayvon Martin. It started with a Facebook post that I wrote in the middle of the night that I often refer to as a love letter to Black people. Patrice put a hashtag in front of Black Lives Matter and Opal helped to create the social media platforms that were designed to connect people online who were outraged about the acquittal of George Zimmerman and bigger than that, outraged about the condition of Black communities and wanted to do something about it and connecting them online so that they could do something offline together. What we knew was that sharing and liking and retweeting was not going to change what's happening in our neighborhoods. That actually people coming together on the ground and organizing was the only key to making sure that Black communities could live a dignified life. We also knew that it wasn't just Trayvon Martin being murdered by vigilantes that were the challenges that Black communities are facing. We know that police violence is a huge issue that our communities face, and that has been true since before any media was paying attention to it. But now that we have this opportunity where the conditions in our lives were being broadcast all over the world, it felt important to make sure that people were getting organized. A year after Black Lives Lives Matter was created, Michael Brown was killed in Ferguson, Missouri by Officer Darren Wilson. And Darren Wilson was subsequently not held accountable by a grand jury that had been convened to decide if there was going to be charges pressed. Black Lives Matter did a freedom ride to Ferguson, bringing Black media, Black journalists, Black healers, doctors, organizers, teachers, people who wanted to lend a hand to the rebellion that had broken out in Ferguson, Missouri. Coming out of that, folks knew that it wasn't just enough to chase ambulances that we could find in every single Black community, but that it meant that we had to go back to our own communities and organize. That's how Black Lives Matter becomes a network. And it didn't just start here, it grew across the world. Black Lives Matter now has chapters in four countries. Also coming off of that, what we found was that we had created this little organization, but it wasn't actually big enough to encapsulate everything. Furthermore, there were tons of or other organizations that were Black-led and Black-focused, but there was no kind of centralized hub where these organizations could convene, could coordinate, 
and have an impact that is bigger than the sum of our parts. And that's really the genesis of the movement for Black Lives, which starts in the winter of 2014 and now has become an incredibly powerful force helping to lead this country towards the vision of what it looks like when Black communities are finally freed. One thing that I'm really proud of is a new bill that the Movement for Black Lives is putting forward, which is called the BREATHE Act. For decades, we have been talking about what it means to divest from policing as a strategy to address the challenges that we face in our communities. The BREATHE Act is the manifestation of what it means to move legislation that does just that, divests from policing and the criminalization of our communities and invests in the infrastructure that our communities need to be safe, to live dignified lives, and to live long lives. In 2016, we experienced a major shift in this country. We moved from eight years of being led by the first Black person to ever be elected president in the history of this country, to being led by somebody who has a completely different philosophy about democracy, about freedom, about who belongs, about who matters. And even though so many of us understand that electoral politics and electoral organizing right? It's a complicated terrain. After 2016's election and the major, major defeat that this movement faced, I became obsessed with making sure that Black communities are powerful in politics so that we can be powerful in every aspect of our lives. I've been voting in elections ever since I was 18. My whole life I've been told that voting is a tool to get the things that we want. I've been told that voting is something that my ancestors died for me to have the right to do. But the reality is, in every single election I've ever voted in, I've never been engaged deeply as a constituent. I've been engaged symbolically, but not substantively. Every single election cycle, when it comes to Black communities, we see things like plates of soul food, fried chicken that's uneaten, photo ops with Black leaders, but we never quite get around to having the kinds of town hall meetings in Black communities that can talk about the ways in which the rules have been rigged against our communities for a long time and what the plans are to change those rules so that Black communities have equal and fair access to things that we need to live well, like healthcare, like affordable housing, like quality schools, like teachers that deserve to get paid for what they actually do. I get tired of this every single year and I'm not alone. Millions of Americans every single year don't participate in the process because they don't believe that the process is for them. And when it comes to black communities, we face a dual issue. On the one hand, there are people in our communities who don't believe that voting does anything to change our lives materially. On the other hand, there are people who fight every single election cycle just to be able to exercise their right to vote, and they're being blocked by opportunistic politicians who want to make sure that Black people are not voting, because Black people tend to vote in such a way that changes this country for the better. In 2017, I left the day-to-day -day operations of Black Lives Matter to begin a new organization focused on making Black people powerful in politics. And it's called the Black Futures Lab and the Black to the Future Action Fund. Our very first project was called the Black Census, where we have conducted the largest survey of Black people in America in 155 years. We took the information from that survey and we translated it into a legislative agenda that legislators can use from City Hall to Congress to make Black Lives Matter. We've also been organizing our communities around this agenda, and to date we have more than 50,000 signers onto an agenda that is intended to improve the lives of Black people, but certainly will improve the lives of all Americans. It's an agenda that looks at how it is that we improve healthcare and make it more affordable and accessible to everybody. It's an agenda that talks about how we transform our economy so that Black Lives Matter. We're not just stopping there. This year is a pivotal election year and probably the most important election in a generation. Right now, we're facing a lot of the same challenges that I talked about, voter suppression and voter oppression in Black communities across the nation threatens to weaken our democracy even more than it is now. So we are doing our hardest work to register Black voters across the nation, 
to expand the number of people who are voting, to make sure that Black voters have the tools that we need to be powerful in politics, and to make sure that Black organizations have the resources and capacity we need to be powerful. One thing I'm really proud of this year is that we also launched our Black to the Future Public Policy Institute, which right now at this very minute is training 41 Black fellows from nine states across the nation to design, win, and implement new policy in cities and states. In January of 2021, no matter who's in the White House, those fellows will launch policy campaigns that we will support that are changing the rules that have been rigged against our communities for generations and that are installing new rules that bring America closer to what it's always promised to be. So Vanity Fair, I wear a ton of hats. And the reason that I wear a ton of hats is because there are so many projects that I feel are important to making sure that we all have the things that we need to live well. And if not us, who? <laughs> one of those projects is one that I am so excited about. It's called Supermajority. And it's a project that I founded with Ai Jen Poo from the National Domestic Workers Alliance and Cecile Richards, former president of Planned Parenthood. And it is a new home for women's activism. In September of 2020, we are launching the largest woman-to-woman -woman voter contact program in the history of this country. For a year, we have been building a growing community of women and our allies who are coming together to be a political force in the most important election in a generation. We've been providing women with the tools they need to organize where they are. We've been connecting women to learn from each other, new skills about how to build and sustain movements, and we are trying to reach women everywhere. Women who may feel isolated by how they feel or what they want for their futures. To let each other know that we are not alone and that when we are organized, we are a force that cannot be stopped. I'll be honest, in March of this year, I was not excited about November, mostly because we had entered into a major public health crisis I could already see that we're in the midst of a crisis in our democracy, and we have a lot to get done this year. It's a pivotal election year. But I have to say that the rebellions of the last few months have re-energized me, re-inspired me to go as hard as possible to make the kind of change that I know we all deserve. One thing that I'm very clear about is that there's so much that we have in common. We all wanna live lives where we feel safe, where we are able to live with dignity and where we're connected. If this pandemic has shown us anything, it's how deeply we are connected and how deeply we depend on each other to survive. And the thing that is making me hopeful is that I don't think anybody wants to go back to that other normal. I think we're all pretty clear that there's gotta be something on the other side. And what makes me hopeful is that we are shaping what it is that's on the other side right now as we speak. Years from now, I hope that what we'll be talking about is how we stepped up in this moment to change the direction of this country and to make it better for all of us. One thing I'm really proud of is that my mom taught me how to survive in a world that doesn't want me to, but that shouldn't be limited to just me. We should all be able to not just survive, but live well and to thrive. As I said before, I believe that all of us should be able to pursue our dreams while we're awake, not just when everybody else is asleep. And that's the kind of world that I'm fighting for. My mom was very clear. She believed that everybody deserved to live with dignity, that you were better than the worst thing that you'd ever done. And trust me, there were a lot of terrible things that I did, but my mother loved me dearly and she loved me deeply. And she always told me to be the best that I could, not just for her, not just for my family, but for myself. I've taken that advice today and I've turned it into the work that I've done for more than 20 years now, fighting to advocate and organize our communities that have been left out and left behind. My mom died recently, just a couple of years ago, but one thing that I do know is that she's walking next to me and I'm quite sure that she's proud, not just of the achievements that, that I've made, but she's proud of the way in which this work is impacting millions and millions of people in their daily lives. She encouraged all of us to step forward with our kindest selves, to take care of each other, and to do it because it's the right thing to do. I follow that advice every single day, and I hope 
that whenever it is that I get to the end of my life, that I build, have built a legacy that is even a small piece of what my mom was able to build for me. Thanks so much for hanging out with me, Vanity Fair. This has been the timeline of my career so far. Guaranteed there's more to come. <laughs>